Are we on? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Chair is uh, either not going to be here or he's going to be late or whatever. Either way, we'll go ahead and get this thing started. And um, welcome to the December 15th ANDAG Public Safety Meeting. Hey, last one of the year. Everybody ready to get ready for next year because we're going to be like a slide going downhill. And uh, before we get started, though, I want to ask the interpreter to be uh, to be introduced and uh, walk us through how we're going to uh, hear uh, what you do not understand today. Good afternoon. To use the interpretation feature, please scroll to the bottom of the Zoom screen where the meeting controls are. Click on the interpretation icon, the world, and select English to your, as your language. If you're joining through the Zoom mobile app, cell phone, tablet, etc., please press the ellipsis, then interpretation, and then choose your language. Finally, click on mute original audio to not hear the original Spanish low in the background. Headsets are available for interpretation. If you're in the meeting room, please check out a headset for the, from the receptionist in the lobby. Buenas tardes. Para hacer uso del servicio de interpretación, por favor, desplazarse a la parte inferior de la pantalla donde aparecen los controles. Haga clic en el icono de interpretación, el globo terráqueo, y seleccione español. Si está utilizando la aplicación móvil de Zoom, desde su celular, tableta, etc., presione los puntos suspensivos, luego interpretación y luego el idioma. Si no desea escuchar el audio original en inglés, en el fondo, por favor, seleccione silenciar audio original. Contamos con auriculares disponibles para el servicio de interpretación. Si se encuentra en la sala de la reunión, por favor, pedir auriculares con la recepcionista en el vestíbulo. Thank you. All right, please uh, rise and join me with the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I had the opportunity last night to uh, spend the evening at a Marine Corps ball and uh, saying the Pledge of Allegiance sure mean, means a lot today to me. Seeing all those young people doing the things I could only wish to do. So, like dance. All right, let's see. Let's get into this script a little bit here. Um, do we have a quorum? Yes, Vice Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you. And uh, let me kind of set the uh, ground rules there a little bit. I want to remind everyone of our process for member and public comments. Members can raise their hands to speak at appropriate points in our agenda. And uh, for members of the public, individuals present at Sandag must complete a speaker slip and present it to the city clerk, which will be taken first, followed by anyone online. If you're a member of the public and would like to speak on any item virtually, please use the raise hand icon in the Zoom toolbar once we reach that item on the agenda. If you're calling into the meeting, please press star nine on your phone. If you would like to make a comment on an item, all comments, whether emailed or live, will be part of today's record. And for the uh, members here today, if I don't see you raise your hand, just go ahead and call out my name and get my attention and we'll go from there. That takes us to item number one, today's agenda. For item number one, Blair Beekman, come to the podium, please. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman for non-agenda public comment. Uh, I think I'll be attending uh, the first part of this meeting and attend the second part on Zoom. It's, it's nice to be here uh, with people. Uh, thank you. Uh, and Zoom is nice too. Uh, I attended the earlier meeting today, so uh, thank you here. As national security issues at the local uh, level in this country need to be considered at this time with the current events of Israel, Gaza, and the Middle East, it is thankful and hopeful that local U.S. communities now and into 2024 can also continue to consider at this time better ideals and good practices that can include ideas of reimagined health and human services and good tech accountability. For SANDAG, San Diego County, and U.S. local communities to want to continue to work towards open democracy, 
accountability and our better ideals at this time and over the next few months, this can work collectively for this country to con continue to work towards the ideas of positive sustainability and peace before war and good ways for the U.S. and its local communities to help stay out of the secrecy, opacity, and duplicity of a wartime democracy and a war economy. We are tired of war in this country, I think. I think we want to work towards peace. Uh, I hope local cities in the U.S. can continue in two, 2024, openness and accountability, and to continue to work towards the ideas of peace before war. I think these pra good practices and good efforts at the local U.S. level in 2024 can give good examples and best practices to all sides in Israel at this time as well, and that I think will be much needed and much respected. I hope we are at a time all sides can want to work more towards negotiation and dialogue in Israel instead of war, violence, and harm as how to decide the future of Gaza and the human rights of all people now living in Israel. We have some national security issues to consider at this time in this country. Hopefully we can continue to ask about tech accountability, open policies, and other good practices into 2024. Thanks a lot again uh, for the meeting today, and it's nice to be in human uh, uh, dialogue, uh, human bodies, <laughs> instead of Zoom. Thank you. Next, we have the truth. This is the truth. That's right. You heard it right. Some of you thought you're going to escape my comments last time, but here I am. I'm lucky that this is my last meeting of the year. I'm very excited about that. And I might be in the safest meeting possible, but that depends on whether some of you like me or not, or what I'm going to say. So despite what the propaganda news spins out, public safety spending is actually up around the county while crime is actually down. The real crime that's been going on up is political negligence, malfeasance, misconduct, coercion, corruption, fraud, waste, and abuse. Not just its end egg either. There's also a problem with many in law enforcement. Not so much the average police or sheriff, but those at the top. To uh, top law enforcement like David Nislight, Admit criminal deception when they say that individuals have no reasonable expectation of privacy when referring to ALPRs. Putting up over 970 ALPR spy cameras all over the county so far just to catch stolen vehicles makes as much sense as saying defund the police just because there's a couple of bad apples. It's collective punishment. It's treating everyone like they're a criminal rather than as innocent like our law demands. The state is using the $1,000 theft they've allowed as the justification to fund a police state with a global corporation flock. While the reality is that according to Sandag's own stats, overall crime is actually down. And there's Kelly Martinez, hello Kelly, who said when she was running for sheriff that, oh my gosh, she's gonna release all the sealed county records so people can get some justice for incidents gone wrong. But has she done that? Nope, the complete opposite. Well, a record number of jail inmates continue to die under her watch. Since 2018, the county has had to pay out over $37 million just for jail lawsuit settlements. And yet they're using those facts to justify body scanners for everyone but them. And Kelly's excuse not to have deputies go through a body scanner. It's high radiation. High for deputies, but low enough for everyone else. Got it. So you need to work on what reality is going on. Thank you. And we have one uh, virtual, or the original draw. Thought you were just gonna sit there, wow. <clears throat> um, thank you. So yeah, public safety, it's such a joke because you know, we'd sit here and rather look at, you know, what's happening with our own communities um, and acting like they're, you know, terrorists when we have a border that's been open, um, just flooding and trafficking human beings across it. And we're basically paying to traffic all of these uh, human beings across the United States, um, all while we, you know, come after our own communities of people and don't protect them. Um, you can't even protect the border, but you'll look at domestic terrorism and you'll spend, you know, we'll spend money on doing things like that. But when it comes to protecting the border and even the kids that are coming across and being trafficked along with the drugs, instead of doing anything about it, we're, you know, uh, basically making money off of it and spending the people's money to make sure that they have anything and everything that they need, all while the people in the community suffer. Um, and, you know, you talk about public safety, but how is that even safe when you have 
military age men coming across the border, um, many of them, you know, getting ready to possibly join the police force and the military. So I guess possibly that would be a reason not to protect the people here and just let them, you know, engage in being a part of law enforcement um, because then you guys can fill your numbers because you guys are, you know, there's such a lack of officers and it's a wonder um, when you're making them do certain things that they don't want to do um, and they know what's coming coming down the pipe that you're coming after our guns, you know, and it's like all while, you know, the police can have the guns and uh, the sheriff and go and just blow people away, like unloading their weapon, you know, but the people, if they want to protect themselves, that's not right. Right. We can't be doing that. That's not okay. But, you know, um, things need to change because you guys do anything but provide any kind of public safety. Thank you. Um, committee comments anywhere? All right, I do not see any. That takes us to I, the consent calendar. There's three items there, two, three, and four. Do we have any uh, public comments on the consent calendar? On the consent calendar, we have um, truth. For the consent, we have truth, item three. Oh, I signed up for two, three, and four, actually. That's okay. I'll speak on all of them with my two minutes. Uh, item three, if you want that one first, is $1.3 million for SANDAG to implement gun violence activities. And that sounds dangerous since SANDAG can't even be trusted with tolls. No thank you to the federal government's unsafe project for neighborhoods. Item two. I did watch the September 15th meeting, partly to check out those minutes, and what I saw was censorship by Jose. I also remember that Tim Curran showed up instead of Perception Al Styler, and I call him Perception Al since he doesn't know a thing about safety at MTS. I'm very glad he's gone. And John, instead of Steve being here as the East County Rep, that's very good because subterfuge Steve is given the safety runner on at MTS too. But I'm hoping to aid in the future minutes recording a meeting longer than 49 minutes this time. That's my goal. Uh, item 4A, Sandag is the middleman for over $1.3 million in Project Safe Neighborhoods money. It almost sounds like the same thing. Hmm. From the Department of Injustice for the Gun Reduction Agenda, even though crime's going down. Oh, well, who cares about rights? Uh, let's see. The public's going to be treated as criminals with future metal detectors, of which I not only called dead on, but also saw being set up in the Sandag lobby. Uh, are you guys going to go through it? It's kind of like those body scanners, right? Rules for some, but not for all. 4B, over 144000 for Chula Vista PD to engrave catalytic converters. If this is a retail theft prevention grant, why not help the stores that have products behind lock and key, like Chula Vista? Uh, 4C is $95,000 for the North County Lifeline to support the REACH Coalition for Survivors of Human Trafficking. Those cultural considerations should have already been part of the program. And ironically, I saw on the North County Lifeline website a photo of students from CSU San Marcos, which is one of the state universities, failing to return cultural artifacts that remains back to applicable tribes. And you can thank the Borders Committee Tribal Symposium for helping me learn that information. Thank you. Next, we have Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman. Uh, to speak on items uh, four and five, uh, that's about uh, uh, federal dollars coming in for a retail theft purchase things. And that is interestingly what the truth was talking about previously, that you're starting a, a whole new series of ALPR asks and purchases uh, for the San Diego area. And in fact, it's it's been a program that's been in, installed throughout California at this time. I think we really have to question it. Uh, my, my words uh, at, at non-agenda public comment was a preface basically to this item. And that even as war is going on in Israel at this time, and we do have national security worries, we luckily, thankfully, can be able to address our better selves and our better ideals and our better practices in this country at this time. And it's with that, we have to be really mindful how we practice the future of our surveillance technology use. We can't just dump in a ton of new ALPR technology 
when we already have a lot in place in San Diego, at least in the city, we have to be honest to admit that and acknowledge that violent crime levels have been seriously reduced. It's being reported all across California over the past several years, even as we have new violent crime issues to be addressing that I do not doubt we have things have been working and that is because we've had a good amount of surveillance technology already in place in our california cities to be dumping in a ton more of new technology is questionable and it needs to be questioned and we can't just sit here and say well there's a war on so we got to practice national security you get whatever you want we have to really parse down and practice ideas of peace and when we do that here we give awesome examples to the rest of the world how they can consider peace instead of war and democracy and openness. Let's be open how we move forward with this subject matter at this time. Thank you. Thank you. And we have one virtual, the original draw. Wow, it's really sad because this world is upside down and inside out. And we have, you know, um, gun and, and gang violence within our own law enforcement. They're the gangs. They're the ones with the guns. They're the ones coming after the people. They're the ones that beat people up for just attending meetings and get exonerated for it. And then you sit here and you're like, we're going to protect people from and prevent violent crime. Are you? Because you're the ones engaging in it. You're the ones, you know, allowing yourselves to do it and acting like, you know, we need to take the guns from the people. And so if there's, you know, some woman who weighs like 100 pounds, let's put this 300 pound man on her with guns uh, you know, taser, handcuffs, bulletproof vest, and then we'll have the police call her a threat. It's so interesting how things work and how upside down everything is. And the fact that you're going to take $1.3 million for one of these and another amount for the next for retail theft. I mean, that's not even a crime anymore, nor is a DUI. People can hit someone drunk and high as a kite and they don't even get arrested. So it's like, I, I, it's just funny to think in like 10% of that's going to Sandag for what? And all that money is just going into people's pockets for salary and a bunch of stuff just so they can strong arm the people and come after the people. That's what everyone needs to understand is this is supposed to be a police state. We're getting into a place where you're going to have to keep us in our zones and change our behaviors so that we capitulate and comply with this new way of living and, you know, uh, pretending to save the climate. And so it's just really disturbing to think that people who are supposed to protect us that you should be able to go to for protection are the very ones coming after you and doing nothing to protect you and telling you that if you did the same thing yeah you'd be in jail but you know if they do it rules for thee but not for me right and you guys can sit there and just like exonerate yourselves and then you know make the people the criminals when the criminals are the ones running this county the ones that are supposed to be enforcing the laws and the entire government are the criminals, and yet we do nothing about it. That's all the commenters. Thank you very much. Uh, committee members, any comments on these items? All right, do I have a motion to uh, approve that. We have a motion by Anderson. Is there a second? Thank you by Kaylin Franks. Please vote. Here for South County, but I have voted. So uh, we have to say yes, vote. Oh, page signs. Okay. There we go. The it's the actual gray button. The gray button. Number one. Four. <laughs> or number two. <laughs> Smart Ellie. And that item passes with those All members right. present. Thank you very much. That takes us uh, I, on to item number 5A, which is a public, well, public safety uh, committee reports. Uh, Dr. Burke. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, just a few agency updates. Um, first, um, you may have all heard Hassan Akrata is retiring at the end of this month. And last week, the board of directors approved, unanimously approved an interim CEO, Colleen Clemenson, who some of you may know, who's um, 
was with the city of San Diego at Sandag for a long time, so she'll be continuing um, leadership here at Sandag. Um, the second update related to Vision Zero and the action plan, and you actually have item number eight on that, so I'm going to let the presenters um, share information about that, but I think that's really a topic that's going to be of interest to this committee when we look at safety on the roads with both pedestrian, bicyclist, and, and motorist, and the work that we're doing there, which is very exciting to see collaboration with our planning and our uh, data science team. Um, work on the Otay Mesa East Port of Entry project is also going to be important. Obviously, has public safety ties as we talk about another border crossing. Um, last week, Sandag was joined by Tokes Amashakan, Secretary of the California State Transportation Agency, and our local partners to celebrate the ongoing progress on this project. Um, we're also continuing to work on the low sand rail realignment, as you know, is a very important um, project to make sure that the bluffs and the tracks. Are, are safe both for our people and um, goods movement. Um, also, the Board of Directors is going to be presented. Um, our next board meeting is January 12th, 2024, and we will be sharing an action plan for the implementation of the tool operations back office system. You may have heard some of the issues that we've had um, there in the news, and that is going to be something that we'll be coming back to the board on, as well as the 2025 regional plan. I know some of you came and participated in a workshop as we look at what the region is going to look like out through 2050 and what are the needs and the goals as we work together um, um, to make those regional um, visions a uh, reality. And so we'll be coming back with our initial um, concept for that. And we're also um, beginning the CEQA process for the airport transit connection, as well as the blue line and purple lines. And that is my last update to the PSC for 2023. Thank you. Any uh, public speaker slips on 5 eight? Yes, we have truths. All right, this is very fun. I love when I can listen to a report and just write some notes and wing it. It's very dangerous, actually. All right, uh, the first one, Hassan is out. That's actually still worth celebrating. I'm sorry to not bring confetti or one of those blower things. I was supposed to bring that. I didn't have time to do it at the Board of Directors. The Vision Zero, I look forward to talking about that more for item eight, but I'm going to say that uh, no one ever talks about shaded sidewalks because I'm a walker. I know how to do that. Uh, and when you're on the sidewalk, no one plants more trees. They're cutting them down for solar panels. So consider that because I tell you, bulb out curbs for the cars uh, for to annoy the drivers doesn't help me as a walker. It just confuses me. Like sustainable slime green bike lanes. It's ugly. Matches the housing that's going up like weeds. Uh, the East Otay may support of entry. Uh, not a fan of that. I mean, no one's going to use it when it costs money. It's not going to help congestion because the, most of the people that are crossing the border don't have a lot of money as it is. They're going back and forth for because they have to, or they have to live the south of the border. So how are they going to afford that toll? And then brings to the next point, speaking of tolls, if the tolls aren't even being collected, how is that system going to be any better than what's already here for the 125, for example? And uh, I heard... You say, what, what's the, what the region's going to look like in 2050, making the regional vision a reality? It's like Disneyland on the teacups. Sometimes you have to get off because I don't see any reality. I see Sandag, uh, a bunch of pipe dreams. This is what we're going to make it. We're going to make it so you don't have to drive. We don't, it's not that we're going to force you to stop driving. We're just going to make it really accessible to walk, bike, scooter, roll, take the public transit where you might get stabbed on it because there's not enough transit security. Very appealing. I'd prefer that the roads get fixed because I'll tell you what, that will help people walking. It will help people crossing the street, you know, and it's gonna help drivers too. Equity, Sandag gloves to mention that word. And yet I don't see it in many of those visions. Thank you. Next we have Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you, Blair Beekman. Sorry, my tone was a little strong on the previous item. My passion, <laughs> that was my passion. Thank you. Um, for this item, uh, you talked about Vision Zero issues. To me, uh, I mentioned at the previous meeting today, uh, as you work on Vision Zero, uh, it, to have a holistic thinking about Vision Zero, that is what we're trying to go for, to work towards tech accountability, which is an important part of uh, Vision Zero adding that to the process uh, for the for community to be involved, to participate in decision-making around tech 
for Vision Zero, so there, to be aware of the tech, the policies of, of the tech, that's building trust and that's building like openness and positive sustainability. That to me is Vision Zero. And so I'm really hopeful what, uh, you know, along with environmental issues, tech accountability, what the future of Vision Zero can be in those terms. So good luck on those efforts with the item. Um, and again, you know, to, to offer, we, we've already made good beginnings in how to address, you know, uh, in the city of San Diego, the future purchases, purchases of smart streetlight surveillance tech. And it's just a matter of applying those good practices now. And, um, you know, there's certain parts of the community uh, that really can help yourselves with that process, that minimal use, minimal new deployment of tech can really do the same things uh, for tech that's already in place in our local cities. We already have a lot of tech in place. We really don't need that much more to be accomplishing the same public safety goals and vision zero goals. And we have to learn to be thinking more in those terms and have conversations with different parts of the community in those terms. That's the lessons I hope we're learning at this time in the next year. Thank you. And we have one virtual, the original draw. So safety on roads. I don't know if you guys know about the 2 million Teslas that were recalled for the self-driving technology that is um, not good because that is putting people in danger on the roads. And uh, especially when they're in a lithium bomb like that and then they totally explode and kill a bunch of people. Um, and the toll road operations, that's something we should be paying the toll road off. I mean, the only reason this came out is because it was in the press. And so everyone's got to like backtrack and figure out what to do because we've got to cover our ass. But you should take the 265 million that wasn't spent to expand the 805 and pay it off so that the people don't continue to get screwed over um, because you care when it's something where you're losing revenue, but not if it's the people um, that are the ones that are paying the cost and then vision zero there is no vision zero because it will never be zero and you know with what they're doing with the otai um, crossing and wanting to like in the last meeting talking about the freight um, and changing their fleets um, to be electric is going to severely um, uh, paralyze the trade industry because you're not going to be able to um, transmit as much goods. And it's kind of weird because everybody talks about how much they, you know, there's the billions of dollars that come in from um, cross-border trade, um, yet you're going to set yourself up to make it so that there's not going to be that much being traded out. And if it is, the cost is going to come down to the people because it's going to cost um, a bunch of these drivers um, a lot of money just to change these trucks if they can at all because there's owner operators that aren't going to be able to play this game and the fact that you know you want to put you know 15 more thousand pounds onto a truck it takes away the amount of freight that they can transfer and just having to spend time on uh, charging a truck is going to severely cut down the amount of time that they're going to be able to be driving um, and so it's just pretty ridiculous to set yourself up for failure like that when none of that's going to ever work and be beneficial to anyone. And that's all the comments. Thank you. I remember Not seeing any. I take it 5B, which Chiefs and Sheriff's Management Committee. Chuck K. Chief. Good afternoon, Chair Rodriguez, Vice Chair Minto, Council, and all members. My name is Chuck Kane. I'm the Chief of Police for the City of Coronado and the representative from the Chief Sheriff's Management Committee Chair. Thank you for this opportunity to provide an update from the Chiefs and Sheriffs during our meeting on November 1st. The Chief Sheriff's Management Committee convened to discuss various ongoing projects at Argus. Argus Director Anthony Ray provided an update on the latest advancements, including UASI grant proposals for cybersecurity cloud transformation, disaster recovery, artificial intelligence, and regional training programs. Director Ray also provided an update on SB 54, the California Values Act, and what Argus is doing to stay compliant. This completes my update from the Chiefs and Sheriff's Management Committee. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, do we have any uh, public speakers on 5B? 
No, in public, we have one virtual, uh, the original draw. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know why these um, uh, those committee meetings aren't um, are only in person. They should also be virtual, so you can be transparent with the people. And Anthony Ray should be the last person working on any of this. He sat idly by while I got the shit beat out of me by one of his sheriffs. As long as and Kelly's does the same stuff, she doesn't care at all. And it's, so it's very sad to see you guys talking about management. Um, the management within everything that you're doing is is severely lacking, but cybersecurity and all of this AI that you want to bring forward. So as long as, you know, there's some kind of cyber threat, then you guys can sit and take our rights and you can sit there and say, in order to protect you, we need to bring in like a digital ID. We need to be able to look at all of your stuff, just like what they did with 9-11. It's like there, I mean, that was an inside job but let's take all the people's privacy from an outside threat, supposed. So now we have to, you know, go to an airport and take off our shoes and be basically anally examined just to go through. And then it's like, hey, the border's right open, right? And it's like, people can just cross there. We don't even need to, you know what? They can even travel without a passport on a plane. It's so great, right? But everything that you guys do is set out to, you know, take all of the rights of the people and make sure that this is a crazy police state. And the fact that you want to use AI um, for any of this, and that most governments are tending to do that now, is a very dangerous when you're doing that, when you're putting hands into the artificial intelligence, it's like, it, have you seen China? I'm just wondering, it's like, do you not know what's going on there? And that's what you guys are bringing into us. So it's we're not going to be able to do anything um, outside of, you know, our social credit score because we're going to be looked at for everything and you're going to use it under the guise of protecting us. And it's such Hegelian dialect, it's double speak that you guys are doing that, but that's how you have to get control of the people and make them give up every right under the guise of protecting them. And you're doing anything but that. You actually do not protect the people. And it's very, very sad because none of you are following your oath. Do I have any other speakers? No other speakers. Okay, thank you. Uh, any um, comments or questions by the committee members? I don't see any, but uh, you're not getting away that easy. This is uh, Chief K's last meeting. He uh, has decided to join the retirement ranks on uh, January 4th. So you're probably going to have something happen over the, uh, you know, holiday. Going to probably want to keep you around a little while. No? <laughs> not copping out to anything are you uh thank you for the acknowledgement um I, if i could just say one thing i would i would say this there are people in this room that i've spent uh my law and for 33 years in law enforcement with i have found uh, the county of san diego the elected the professional staff the law enforcement members the fire folks um to be some of the most innovative people that I've ever worked around and I'm proud to be part of this community. And I, I'm i looking forward to a little change and uh, it's been uh, my pleasure to serve in the city of Coronado, a very supportive community. Um, so I just wanna say thank you. Yeah. Just remember, um, you don't have to get up early every morning. You can do your chores on the week, weekdays. You don't have to wait till the weekend. I don't get up early now. <laughs> All right, then. Okay, well, we're going to move on to item number 5C, which is uh, County Chief's uh, Association Report. Uh, Chief. All right, good afternoon, Vice Chair Mento and committee members. My name is Dave McQueed. I'm the Fire Chief of the Ranch of Santa Fe Fire Protection District and the Vice President for the San Diego County Fire Chiefs Association. County Chiefs met on November 2nd. Uh, we had a presentation by County OES. The New Haven platform for evacuations has changed its name. So now it's called Genesis Evacuate and it is completed and they are looking to secure funding for the books that are very similar to the public safety grid that we use currently with first, uh, first responders. We're looking to have the training for the evacuation platform in first quarter 24 with hopefully a complete rollout in May of 2024. And then there's continued uh, continued discussions on the ambulance patient offload um, times, which is called APOT, and that pertains to those agencies that transport. 
And that is the end of the report. Thank All you. Right, thank you. Speaker Slips. Yes, we have truth. Well, I'm glad, you know, you got me got my 5C and not my 5B because 5C was just incredibly detailed report that I could just speak forever about. Uh, David, I do appreciate firefighters because they do a very hard job, work very hard with, I, I can't say with no respect though, because I think everybody respects firefighters. Um, so all I really heard was something called Genesis, something related to a grid with the books. I don't know what that means. Thank you for that. Um, I find that that title Genesis though, to be a little bit strange of a choice. Why that? Because it's related to books. Is the grid going to overload like everything else? Is, it, is the fleet becoming electric, all electric? No, because it's not realistic. I forget where I heard that recently, but someone in some meeting that I was in this week was talking about there is no way that the firefighters are ever going to have an all electric free fleet. It's not possible. And actually, it would be very dangerous if that were to happen because. Some people like to call it a lithium bomb, which I have to admit, it does crack me up to hear that every time. Uh, but lithium batteries are dangerous, very combustible. And so if the firefighters were ever to be mandated to have an electric fleet, man, we would be in trouble. I mean, the fire would be in the right place at the right time with the right people to respond. But I don't think we need any more problems. We have enough uh, lithium fires everywhere, particularly at landfills. So here's my public service announcement. Please do not throw your lithium batteries into the garbage. It goes to the landfill where fires emit all the time. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you, Blair Beekman. Yeah, to further add, uh, good luck on how we can learn practices, the public can learn practices about the future of uh, uh, lithium fire uh, that happen, fires that happen in their own neighborhoods or homes, uh, how we can learn skills to put out those fires, how that can be shared with the public, because I think we don't quite know yet how to do that. I think we're learning to and be more open about it. Good luck in those continuing efforts. I wanted to thank yourselves for, um, I attended uh, the, the UDC uh, UASI public meeting uh, at the end of November, I think it was, around uh, UASI grant funding for San Diego County for, for the next year, for the next few years. It was interesting and it was open to the public. I, I don't know if you've done that before. Uh, this is my first year attending. The fact it was open to the public to watch, you know, the different projects proposals being asked for and talked about, it was great. It was really, really awesome. And for you guys uh, to make the project proposal uh, process open and just accessible, uh, great steps, really nice. And uh, I'll definitely have to be sharing that with uh, Bay Area who don't do that anymore. They used to do that. They stopped doing that. And they're suffering for it, I think. Uh, they grow confused sometimes within their own government uh, about practices because of that. And uh, it'll just be nice if they could be more open and accessible in the future, uh, like you guys are doing. Thank you. It's our good democracy. And uh, it's just the good stuff. Thank you. Uh, to conclude, um, at, the, at those project proposals, there was uh, a lot of talk about communication practices and needs. I wanted to say at that time, uh, I can say it here, that I'm interested in how, you know, uh, you know, wireless communications and, and uh, RICS communications can be a process accessible to the public in times of emergency too. Thank you. Next, we have virtual, the original draw, followed by Janine. Yeah, so, you know, obviously evacuations are important, but it's a wonder why you guys don't ever acknowledge the lithium bombs and um, the fact that you can't put them out. I mean, so obviously you would know, I mean, why would you too also say you? it's not possible for the fleet to be electric? I mean, that would be terrifying. But just to think about the fact that these batteries can combust underwater and stay on fire, or you could put them out potentially, and then they'll just keep recombusting. And so you have to use so much water, you'd be 
it'd be more beneficial to douse them in some sand or something like that um, just for that reason. But nobody, I mean, other states will recognize it. The firefighters are actually saying we have to figure something out because this is incredibly ridiculous that they can't be put out and they're like, they can't even do their job. Like, and, and with that, and then we don't ever acknowledge the chemtrails that are, um, you know, spraying nanoparticulate matter, nanothermite, which then goes on to the land and is highly combustible as well. So, you know, it's like you want to talk about evacuations and, you know, different things, but you're not acknowledging something that is a very severe risk to the population. Um, instead, because we're pushing it, like everyone has to have this fleet, everyone has to have this kind of vehicle. But I mean, you're not ever addressing the potential damage and concerns that it will do to the environment. Uh, if everything just goes up in flames and you can't put it out, it's basically bringing hell on earth. So I just don't understand why there are some um, that find this very disturbing and of uh, heightened, um, you know, uh, 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 measure, like safety concerns and then other people just ignore it uh, and you don't ever you know address it but you'll talk about like evacuations and stuff like that um, but this is something that needs to be addressed and figured out because you're going to one day face a fire you won't be able to put out what are you going to do then next we have Janine Hello, my name is Janine, and I live in Ramon, and I have recently become very interested in um, our civil defense, but right specific, specifically right now in the evacuation process, because we've had two fires and it hasn't gone well. Um, but we've been very, very, very fortunate given the circumstances that they went as well as they did. And so I'm curious if there's any conversation about road capacity and carpooling. Um, I, FEMA recommends that community involvement start in the beginning, but I have never had any announcement of being involved in an evacuation plan and engaging non-English speakers or the disabled community. And I am looking for a venue. So if any of you know of a venue for community participation in your evacuation plan, or if I, there's a list to be put on to be given an announcement when whatever you have generated becomes at all available to the public, I'd like to be on that. My email you have is jmonio, M-O-N-I-O-T at AOL.com. And I really want to know if you have any vehicle limitations that you're thinking about doing or how to route within the community dependent on where the fire is and to change directions. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. And that completes public comments. Thank you. You know, the last speaker just brought up a, um, a really good point. You know, Chief, we might think about a future meeting where we talk about some of the new ideas, actually a little bit more about um, you know, reverse 9-11 type of things and um, how people are being notified to move out. And so just so that people understand there's a little bit more to it than just, oh, we're creating, you know, new evacuation routes. So. Yeah, absolutely. That's a key component to um, an evacuation plan is the educational component for the civilians to actually understand the, um, seriousness of when a 9-11 or reverse 9-11 happens and um, you know, for people to actually evacuate when they're told to. Um, there's reasons why we put out the notices in a series and uh, that is to try and eliminate the uh, road capacity for vehicles actually leaving a neighborhood or a community. Uh, you know, you might, uh, I might wanna suggest that you get hold of uh, Justin over at Santee, um, because if we could put together some kind of little video, we'd be more than happy to put that out on our um, television station also. So that way people can tune in from anywhere in the county. Absolutely. Thank you. Any uh, member comments or questions? All right, I don't see any. That, uh, 
is all informational item takes us to item number six, which is we're going to postpone that to a future meeting. Uh, Tony Ray is supposed to give that, uh, but he is out sick today. So anybody uh, want to just pass that off or how's that going to go, I guess? Um, I don't know. Peter? Do, do we want to take public comment because it's notice? Are there any speaker slips? Yes, we do. Okay, we'll go ahead and take the public comment. And that way, uh, when we do bring that back, we'll probably be able to answer those questions when it does come back a lot easier. We have four in person. First will be Patricia Monragon, followed by Aaron Grassi. Good afternoon, uh, Public Safety Committee. I'm disappointed that, you know, part of the public comment is in response to the presentation that is given in the update. Um, but I will go ahead and comment on my prepared comments and not add anything that I would have otherwise added. Uh, Patricia Mondragon, Regional Policy Manager for Alliance San Diego. We are concerned about both access and data security for the Argus database. Information stored in Argus contains information that could easily identify and flag a person as undocumented to a Border Patrol agent authorized to access Argus. The Department of Homeland Security alone has over 500 agents that have access to Argus. Border Patrol has had access to Argus database since 2016. Argus links to additional databases such as Be on the Lookout and Crime Stoppers. Its reach is long and its access vast. One of the biggest weaknesses of the system is that it relies on agencies to police themselves when it comes to the proper authorized access and use of the system and the data within. A system that stores an immense amount of personal data on all San Diegans and San Diego visitors. Local government, SANDAG included, has an obligation to serve and protect all San Diego residents, regardless of their immigration status. Continuing to allow Border Patrol access to the Argus database is dangerous because it provides Border Patrol with personal identifying data that can be used to deport our community members. This runs counter to SANDAG's commitment to create a San Diego region where every person who visits, works, and lives can thrive. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Aaron Sermona Grassi. I'm the policy director at Alliance San Diego. Uh, disappointed to hear that uh, there's no presentation today and that uh, Tony Ray is out sick. I hope he recovers soon. You know, we were looking forward to uh, receiving information, more information about Argus. There's not a lot of information out there for community to know what is and isn't being shared, and it's really important that that be made transparent. Um, so some of the concerns that we have that I hope will be answered in the presentation, um, you know, we're concerned that Argus could potentially contain information such as driver's licenses, and identification numbers that could help Border Patrol identify the immigration status of individuals and lead to the deportation of community members. Uh, for example, I know with police reports, typically you have to provide your name and other information. Even if you're a witness or a victim, um, it would be a real travesty, right, if we have witnesses and victims that are going to end up being deported because they have filed a police report. In fact, if that is the case, right, folks would um, be less likely to cooperate and come forward. So again, you know, I know we're, no, we're still learning what information is in there. I, I really, really hope that there'll be the transparency to provide some of those answers. Um, the other thing I'll mention that I do know is that uh, I, my, it's my understanding Border Patrol and other DHS agencies uh, signed an agreement that they will not use data for immigration enforcement purposes. However, one of the things I'll point out is there's a very, very long history of these agencies particularly Border Patrol, uh, not being truthful. Um, this includes lying about open air detention sites. This was recent. Um, it also includes having illegal shadow units called critical incident teams, which were disbanded but existed for a long time to destroy evidence, intimidate witnesses, and cover up use of force cases. So, you know, even though supposedly there are protocols put in place by signing an agreement, we have deep concerns that that's not enough. We look forward to hearing more at the next meeting. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next, we have Lily Irani, followed by Truth. Hi, my name is Lily Irani, and I'm the faculty director of the UC San Diego Labor Center, as well as an organizer with Tech Workers Coalition San Diego. And if you're wondering why Labor Center director would be here commenting on this issue, it's because immigration is absolutely um, a labor issue, and the safety of workers is the safety of everybody. So I'll, I want to first support the comments made by Patricia Mondragon and Erin surumoto Grassi. Uh, they're deeply researched and engaged in this issue. Um, from my perspective, California SB 54 was passed with the idea that law enforcement would be more effective if people could trust that there would not be collaborations between law enforcement and Homeland Security, whether CBP or ICE. Data sharing from law enforcement to Argus, and then Argus sharing or selling that data with CVP or ICE is absolutely a violation of SB 54. Key to SB, the idea between, of SB 54 was about the perception of trustworthiness. So I, I agree with Aaron Surimoto Grassi that data is often shared without, you know, outside of the bounds of policy, even if the policies are restricting data sharing for immigration enforcement, uh, the mere perception is enough to destroy trust in our systems of public safety. Further, we believe that this is not a database of people who have been convicted. This is a database of people who have encountered police who have come under suspicion. So this affects everyone, but it especially and inequitably affects people in low-income communities and Black and Latino communities who have more contact with the police. Finally, I want to make a point um, co-authored with Seth Hall of San Diego Privacy, who could not be here in person. Entrusting Argus with oversight of Argus is frankly not oversight. The job of detecting misuse or abuse of Argus has been left to the agencies who've been given access to that vast database, the police themselves. It is neither Your just is nor ethical to allow oversight to continue in this way. Thank you. Let's say we don't need a report because nothing's going to change. Teresa's Border Patrol will continue to open the floodgates. Just come right in. Before SB 54, there was over 1,000 ICE transfers. By 2021, there was only 18, despite the fact that 90 ICE requests granted were convicted criminals with charges such as attempted murder, domestic violence with injury, and child molestation. And when Mayday Tony Ray read those crime stats during the Board of Supervisors meeting last year, the pro-illegal immigration peanuts gallery reaction was laughing. Now, when I came in person last month and added the new SB 54 related information about how last year there were also criminals transferred that were convicted of distributing or possessing child pornography, I then asked the peanuts gallery if it was still funny and you could hear a pin drop. But money talks for most, rather than a pesky constitution for the United States of America that I believe every single rep and law enforcement officer here took an oath to defend. But what I've learned is that oaths mean nothing to turncoats. If you've never even read it, how could you even know what to defend? So even though illegal immigration is a federal crime, Sandag's artists removed access to immigration-related records. That would amount to aiding and abetting criminal activities. It is criminal omission to leave out applicable terms of illegal alien, federal immigration, and undocumented. From Marbury versus Madison in 1803, quote, all laws which are repugnant to the Constitution are null and void, end quote. And from Miranda versus Arizona, quote, where rights secured by the Constitution are involved, there could be no rule making or legislation which would abrogate them, end quote. So any law that the state creates that goes against the Constitution are supposed to be ignored. Just because something has been made legal does not make it lawful or just. Whenever sheriffs, police, or other government reps enforce unlawful dictates, they have violated their oaths, aiding and abetting a crime, and have compromised the values they claim to uphold. And that, in turn, makes them lose respect, while the individual loses self-respect in the process. That values act is valueless to me. We have one more in person, Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman, thank you. I moved here uh, to San Diego from the San Francisco Bay Area, San Jose, uh, a year and a half ago now. 
Uh, Argus is new to me. How you guys work uh, with Argus? I've I've learned that you know Sandag helped create Argus back in about 1980 or so. So you guys have kind of a familiar, you know, good relationship with each other and the county. That uh, in in the Bay Area, uh, NICRIC, which is a national uh, data collection agency that was developed after 9/11, uh, that's what. That's kind of the main agency up in, in the Bay Area that also LA uses. They have a, a, a what is it called, a data collection center. Uh, that uh, there is one here in San Diego, but it's just simply not talked about as often as as Argus, because Argus has already developed, uh, has been developed. So um, I'm trying to piece together how these systems work. In the Bay Area, a few years ago in San Jose, we had a big argument about. Uh, how people who are arrested and detained, uh, if can their status be addressed once they're in detention and can uh, customs be called in to take them away? Uh, and that was a real debate about uh, privacy laws, uh, respect for the individual uh, versus, you know, the uh, public safety at, at, at hand. So uh, it went back and forth, and I think it's a good precedent and lessons in how to address the future of this subject and all. There's a few, you know, federal data collection agencies uh, to bring, uh, you know, data collection down to a very bare minimum for this sort of information, and perhaps to leave Argus out of this loop uh, could be an idea. Uh, that's kind of the thinking I'm having about this subject. Thanks for your time. We have four virtual, starting with the original draw, followed by Janine. Yeah, it's sad when the people that are supposed to protect you become the Gestapo, then there is no transparency or truthfulness or anything like that coming from any of those individuals. And they want to share this data and data is never secure. And it's always going to be shared with the wrong people uh, to then come after certain individuals, just like with January 6th shenanigans. And so it's wonder, do you sell this data? Are there subscriptions to get this data? Just like with all these other databases that you collect information on and then use it against the people because you know i know i'm in this system not just from the sheriff and being arrested and beaten up but also from dhs for not wearing being able to wear a mask and getting thrown to the ground so you know and it's like then i get treated like i'm a criminal and then we'll say you know let's protect the illegals who come in who are committing crimes actually you know molesting rape murder trafficking tons of things and then someone can just go to a meeting or try and just enter a building without muzzling their face and can be beaten up and stuff like that and then be put in this system. So, I mean, how is that okay? And then you have, you know, officers who beat people up, nothing happens to them and they aren't in this system. But if I did that same thing, it would be a crime. So, you know, the way you guys want to use all of this information and act like you need to share it with all of these different agencies, it always bites us in the butt. It always comes and it, it, it harms the people because you're not actually protecting them. If you're sitting here saying like out of trust, we're not going to go after like actual criminals and then have people who aren't criminals be in that system. I mean, is that not upside down and inside out? But it's ridiculous because that's your guys' job is to be the Gestapo and you're doing exactly what you're meant to be doing because you need to bring us into a police state so that the people have no rights, no freedoms, nothing. And all you want to be like, we're transparent, trust us. You're anything but. And you took an oath and none of you uphold it. Your time is up. Janine? Hi, my hand was raised by mistake. This is item six. Right, my hand just stayed. Next we have Lu Lucky Aiden. Hello, good afternoon, public safety. Uh, my name is Lucky Aiden. I am the youth organizer at PANA. The Partnership for the Advancement of New Americans. 
I'm deeply concerned that RGS database contains information such as driver's license numbers and ID numbers that could help Border Patrol identify the immigration status of individuals and lead to deportation of community members. Public safety is dependent on community trust in law enforcement. Allowing Border Patrol and DHS access to the RGS database erodes community trust in local law enforcement and causing a chilling effect, which makes community members less likely to call lo our local police department when a crime occurs. This puts the public safety at risk. I urge you to remove Border Patrol access to the Argus database to restore justice within our community. Thank you so much. Asma Adi. Hi, my name is Asma Abdi. I'm a policy associate with PANA. Um, we are deeply concerned that the ARGIS database contains sensitive information. For example, victims of crimes or witnesses of crimes who file police reports usually have to put an ID number on the police report. And Philadelphia actually stopped providing ICE access to their PARS databases because they were worried that ICE was using the database to arrest and deport victims and witnesses. While Border Patrol has signed an agreement that they will not use the data for immigration enforcement purposes, there's a long history of Border Patrol not being truthful, and this includes lying about detaining individuals in an open air detention sites and even having illegal shadow units like critical incident teams that were used to destroy evidence, intimidate witnesses, and cover up use of force cases. Local government, SANDAC included, has an obligation to serve and protect all San Diego residents regardless of their immigration status. Continuing to allow Border Patrol to access the Argus database is dangerous because it provides Border Patrol with personal identifying data that can be used to deport our community members. This runs counter to SANDAG's commitment to create a San Diego region where every person who visits, work, works, and lives can thrive. I urge you to oppose this. Thank you. Next, we have Seth Hall. Thank you, committee. Uh, I hope that the presentation uh, that's upcoming will cover how Argus is protected from abuse and misuse. As was referred to earlier, uh, our understanding is that the individual agencies that are provided access to Argus are supposed to self-police themselves. And I think that we need to do better than that in the city of San Diego. Uh, this is an incredibly powerful tool that you have created. And I think that holding, uh, you know, being accountable and responsible for that incredibly powerful tool starts at this committee and starts with this committee caring about how the data in this system is used and how it's overseen and what we do about it when we find out that it's misused or abused. Thank you. That's all com comments. Any uh, uh, committee members? Okay, thank you. We're going to go on to item number six, I mean, number seven, a discussion on the transition to the uh, CIBRS and NIBRS crime reporting system. Doctor and team, and team, bless you. Good afternoon, my name is Caroline Stevens and I'm a senior research analyst with Argus. Today I'm gonna to provide an overview on the regional transition to cybers and NIBRS crime reporting. And for those of you who are new to this topic, I wanna to take a moment to bring you up to speed. So for the past seven years, Argus has been working towards the goal of providing cybers and NIBRS crime data to the region. This project began in 2016 when Argus received a federal grant to collect standardize and format thousands of data values from 10 local law enforcement agencies, and then to transmit this data through a real-time interface to US Department of Justice. After building out a reporting database, hundreds of hours of interface testing, quality control procedures, and seven years of monthly regional meetings with our agency crime analysts throughout the region, the Sandag Criminal Justice Research Division and Argus are excited to share the first exploration of cybers and neighbors data for San Diego. 
Um, and this presentation is intended to serve as a learning session just as much as it is an initial presentation of the data. So please feel free to ask questions and provide feedback. So today I'm gonna to talk about what are the key elements of cybers and NIBRS reporting. Um, then we'll dive into the old uniform crime reporting summary reporting system and how that's different. And then I'm gonna talk about impact to the region and how you can access this data at a more granular level in the future. And then I'm gonna turn the presentation over to my colleague, Dr. Octavio Rodriguez, and he's gonna walk you through the first regional cybers and NIBRS analysis for 2023. So let's start with the basics. NIBRS stands for the National Incident-Based Reporting System. In 2021, NIBRS became the national standard for law enforcement agencies to report their crime cases and arrests to US DOJ. Under NIBRS, each agency uh, sends reports on 52 different types of crime and eight different types of arrest reports. And agencies send 58 unique pieces of information about each crime case. NIBRS collects detailed information about offender characteristics, victims, relationships between suspects and victims, um, the characteristics of criminal incidents and law enforcement's response to those incidents. CYBRS is extremely similar to NIBRS, it's just the California version of NIBRS. Um, each state has their own version. Um, CYBRS collects additional data elements on uh, things that are specific to California, such as gang-related crimes, hate crimes, domestic violence incidents, and these data values would not have otherwise been included in NIBRS data collection. So the state CYBRS program was actually implemented after the federal NIBRS deadline, which is why for the first year in 2021, we sent all the data directly to US DOJ. And then in 2022, when Cal DOJ was ready to accept our data, we began sending our data to Cal DOJ and they now forward it onward to US DOJ. Um, but before we dive more into, the, into NIBRS and cyber specifics, I wanna talk about our legacy crime reporting system. So the Uniform Crime Reporting Summary Reporting System, or UCR summary, has been used for the past 40 plus years to report and gather crime statistics across the nation. Under UCR summaries, agencies submit 12 simple tabular files or flat file reports monthly. Um, and these reports actually only collect on eight types of crime and only five data elements on those eight types of crime. So additionally, it uses what's called the hierarchy rule where it only reports on the highest crime or the most serious offense within a crime. And due to the lack of depth in this data and analytical flexibility, it's hard to understand the circumstances around crime um, from UCR summary. So now that we have a better understanding of all the systems at hand, let's draw some comparisons. So UCR summary only reports on the most serious charge or offense within a crime case. Cybers and Nibers reports on up to 10 offenses within each crime case. So under Cybers and Nibers, it may look like crime is increasing, but actually it's just the depth and scope of the data that has increased. Um, and then also, we're now collecting data on 52 types of crime versus eight types of crime and eight types of arrest versus 23 types of arrest. So we've really expanded kind of the records of crime that we look at. Um, another important thing is that the dates on which these reports are tabulated on. So UCR summary was actually tabulated and collected on the date that the crime was reported to the agency. So if the crime occurred in January, but it wasn't reported until February, it would flow with that February reporting month. Now, crimes are actually tabulated by the month that they occurred. So if the crime is reported late, it still goes back into that January report. This can make crime numbers monthly look very different under the two systems. Um, and it's important to remember that when you're comparing those systems, but shouldn't compare them because they're quite different. Um, also, we're doing real-time transactional crime reporting now under Cybers and NIBRS. So every two hours, we push updates on thousands of incidents to Cal DOJ, and those updates are forwarded in real time onward to US DOJ. Prior to that, under UCR summary, we were just sending updates once a month in a tabular style report. So it looks quite different in terms of um, the transactional nature and changes to the data over time. And then also now we're collecting whether the crime is attempted or completed on all types of crime. And we're also collecting weapons information on all types of crime. So it's quite a big difference, but I'm talking a lot about offenses and you might ask how are offenses actually assigned to crime cases? Um, Cause it's not completely clear off the bat. 
So offense codes are assigned when an officer is in the field, they write a crime report, they assign charge codes or penal codes based on the elements of the crime. We actually reviewed 4,000 different charge codes in cooperation with the Sheriff's Department, and we assigned Nibers and Cybers offense codes to each of those charge codes. Um, and how offenses are tabulated from these charges and offense codes depends on the crime against category. So for crimes against persons, it's one crime per victim or one offense count per victim. So for crimes such as homicide and rape, if there's two victims of homicide, there's two counts of homicide. For crimes against property, it's one offense per distinct operation of crime. So if you have a robbery where three people have items stolen, there's still just one count of robbery. Crimes against society is actually an entirely new category of crimes that we're tracking under neighbors and cybers. This includes things um, like prostitution and gambling and vagrancy, and it's one offense per distinct operation of crime. And so, and also just one call out to crimes against property. It's slightly different for motor vehicle thefts. It's one count per vehicle stolen. For group B offenses, it's one count per one arrest. So let's take a look now at a real world example. And this is kind of based off of something that actually a crime incident that happened in the region several years ago. So two offenders walk into a convenience store. Offender one pulls out a handgun, demands cash from the clerk. Offender two knocks the customer on the floor. Offender one shoots the clerk, takes money from the cash register. And as he leaves, he shoots the customer. As offender two leaves, he takes some merchandise from the store. How many cybers and nibers offenses will be reported? Okay, so five offenses is the answer, but under UCR summary, only that robbery would have been reported. So this is actually a really good illustration of how it can look like crime is increasing under this new system, but really it's just the breadth of the data that's being presented here that's increasing and how much more data we are collecting. So how is this gonna impact law enforcement agencies? It's been a huge, work lift for the first five years of this project, but eventually, and we're starting to see it now, this is gonna result in time savings for your agencies um, and simplified quality assurance and data overview processes. So we really appreciate all of the cooperation from your agency crime analysts over the years, and we're hoping that it's gonna make their workload much easier because they're not gonna be having to do these monthly totals of how many crime cases occurred under this category. It's just gonna be real-time transactional reporting. Argus has built out a variety of reports showing their cybers and nibers data, and they're simple, clear, and easy to use, and your staff at pretty much any level can download these reports and look at the data quite easily. Um, next slide. Thank you. Okay. And finally, I just want to talk about the policy implications of this new reporting system. So when used to its full potential, cybers and nibers reporting can help to identify when and where crime is taking place, the form that it takes, and the characteristics of victims and perpetrators. Armed with such information, law enforcement agencies can better define the resources they need to fight crime. And cybers and nibers is the future of crime reporting and the national standard to better understand how San Diego is measuring up against other regions. Um, also, agencies that are cybers and nibers compliant are eligible for more grant opportunities and greater allocations on those grant at times. And lastly, and most importantly, through the enriched data collection that nibers and cybers provides, we're able to provide more transparency to the public on what is happening with crime data. So in 2024, Argus is gonna begin a quarterly push to the Sandag Open Data Portal, sharing um, crime incidents at a very granular level. So you'll be able to go in and download and understand what's happening in your census tract or at your zip code level um, and see individual level crimes. Um, with that, we look forward to sharing more on this in the future and I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Rodriguez. Thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, Vice Chair, members of the committee, thank you very much for having me today. Uh, my name is Octavio Rodriguez and I'm the Principal Criminal Justice Researcher here at SANDEC. Uh, as my colleague Caroline mentioned at the beginning, uh, this is the first time that uh, SANDEC is reporting using the new uh, NIBOR cyber system. Uh, 
once all the agencies manage to complete the transition and start um, collecting and um, generating those data, we were able to pull that information and make the first analysis of, of that pool uh, covering the first half of 2023. Um, some of the highlights of this initial Niber Cybers publication um, is that uh, we see lower numbers of crime incidents reported, uh, of which more than half were property crimes, and that most violent crimes have decreased at least in the first half year, uh, in the first half of the year. Um, but looking specifically at each uh, uh, crime category, uh, we had overall 65,840 Group A offenses reported between uh, January and June of 2023. Uh, and as mentioned uh, before, uh, almost three-fifths of all those crimes were uh, property crimes. Um, we saw overall decreases in all categories uh, of crime, but uh, the largest decline we saw was property crime, despite of that being the largest uh, chunk of the uh, of the crimes committed in that portion of the year. Um, when talking about uh, crimes against persons, uh, we had, as the slide mentioned, 15,766 uh, crimes against persons reported. Uh, that's about one in four uh, of all crimes. Uh, what we saw is that all crimes decline with the exception of assault and intimidation. Um, and worth mentioning that at least these two crimes were not reported on their UCR uh, previously. So this is, uh, this is the first time that we're, that we're discussing these crimes. Uh, for specifically for crimes against persons, assaults accounted for more than two thirds of all crimes. Uh, and it's worth mentioning that there was a 17% decrease in homicides. Uh, it's important to highlight as well that uh, that decrease is actually consistent with what we have been seeing uh, in the rest of the country. We've been seeing uh, decreases in homicides in, in larger metropolitan areas, similar to San Diego uh, and other, in other uh, larger and smaller cities as well. Um, so we mentioned that the majority of the crimes were property, and of those, around 45% were our larcenies of, or thefts. Uh, on average, there were about 8.8 .8 property crimes reported each hour, that is 211 uh, reported per day. Uh, same as with crimes against, against persons, several of these crimes were not reported under UCR. So as Caroline mentioned earlier, uh, crimes against society is a new category that's included within the NIBRS and CYBRS uh, system. Uh, so of course, it's the first time that we, uh, that we report on, on these type of, types of crimes. Uh, what we can see from the data is that only uh, drug equipment violation and prostitution increased uh, from uh, the first half of 2022 to the first half of 2023. Uh, important also to mention that uh, increasing prostitution was due to large demand uh, reduction operations across several jurisdictions. So that's why we're seeing uh, large, larger numbers in this first half of the year. Finally, we can uh, just see what uh, are the top five offenses reported every day. Uh, Larceny, because of course, was the most reported crime daily. That is uh, around 88 uh, crimes of larceny reported a day. Um, of these, of course, property crimes represented a higher proportion of daily reports. And also, it, it is important to mention that at least one crime category, uh, or one of each one crime of each category, is represented in the top five offenses reported daily. And also important to mention that three out of the top five. Uh, were crimes that were not reported previously on their uh, UCR. So that was a, a quick update, a quick overview of what uh, crime statistics under Cybers Nibers look like in the first half of 2023. Uh, we look forward to have this information uh, available for the public in our um, in our website and also in an open data portal, as well as uh, the more uh, more complete uh, information that Argus uh, is going to present. Thank you very much. Uh, members of the committee. 
Can I ask a couple questions before we go to public comments? Um, Cause it's, you know, it's been a while since I've been in that business, about 14 and a half years. Some crimes seem to uh, take on maybe a different uh, personality for like a better term. Like for instance, uh, you have prostitution there, but I don't see anything that actually relates to the uh, pimping and pandering side of it, also known today as human trafficking, which has a much broader um, outreach or stretch. Um, so I'm concerned about where that is and how that's recorded. Uh, if I'm looking for that kind of information as a uh, as a street cop, for instance, want to know where to be able to go to enforce and help people. Um, you know, some crimes like torture, for instance, maybe people don't talk about it. That's one crime that doesn't require any injury. Where would you uh, have something like that? Do you have any statistics about any kind of uh, cases that have come forward similar to that? Because that's also something that's used a lot in a uh, pimping and pandering type of case where, um, so if I'm some being trafficked, you know, the human trafficking part of it, but I've been abducted, there's been an abduction for the purpose of prostitution. It's only one crime. It's a false imprisonment crime. So you only get one crime, I guess, recorded for that, right? So it's, it's just reported or can it be on the crime case? I, I don't, I guess maybe that's a question. So it depends on the nature of the case. So to answer your original question, there are uh, NIBRS tracking codes for human trafficking. And then there's three different codes for um, tracking different elements of prostitution. There's 40 A, B, and C. I can't remember the exact language around each one of them, but I believe 40 C is purchasing prostitution, and that's what they saw an increase in. So that's that's what was being op apprehended in that in those special operations that Dr. Rodriguez was talking about. Um, so your second question, if you could repeat that. Well, I, th I was talking about uh, like, for instance, if you have multiple crimes uh, that are committed, like they say in a torture game. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it could be just because of the intimidation because it's yes. not required to uh, have an injury. It could be that you're false in prison because I'm not letting you walk on the other side of the street. There's a lot of things that are um, surrounding that kind yes. of a thing. Yeah, so so intimidation is now tracked through 13C. What, um, what does that exactly mean though, intimidation? I mean, so, and how is it against the law to intimidate somebody without actually understanding what the um, what that means? Uh, maybe it's like what we used to call, um, you know, threatening a witness, or uh, yes. it, it could be, you know, terrorist threats, things of that nature. So, according to the 13C definition, it can be anything from you know, threatening verbally, or it can be like issuing like a, like a bomb threat is another one that we had talked about in our last chief's meeting, because 13C can be a little bit broad. Um, but it's grouped in actually as kind of a, there's 13A, which is aggravated assault, 13B, which is a simple assault, right? So, and then there's 13C, which is kind of a verbal threats or intimidation. So all of that is tracked and on the ODP we'll have a full list of definitions with kind of the breadth of each category and the situations that do and don't apply in a downloadable PDF. And then we've also included um, kind of more information about the background of cybers and ivers as well. So that'll all be up in 2024. And also we're working with some of your agency crime analysts for further presentations to like city councils and things like that for better understanding at the local level. Okay. How about like, for instance, an, an attempt murder? Is that just now a uh, assault with a deadly weapon? How, how does that get tracked? Because um, I could, uh, you know, intend to kill you, but because we have such great firefighters and paramedics these days, I save your life. And now it's not even a attempt murder anymore. So, so that, doesn't that really kind of change the way we're really, what we're calling crime and it really does falsely reduce the amount of crime that we're seeing in our community. I don't know, maybe the chiefs can answer that. Maybe Sheriff, I don't, I don't know. I defer to the chiefs on everything. Uh, I, I think that there's a lot of nuance in how 
homicide and attempted homicide under Nivers and Cybers is categorized now, and some of them do flow into that aggravated assault category if it's not successful. Um, Noy, do you want to add anything? Yeah, that's correct. Um, a, a attempted homicide would be uh, classified as an aggravated assault. Okay, well, maybe I should ask this question specifically. How much input is given by the chiefs or law enforcement into how to classify any of these crimes? And here's why I'm asking that question. And this is not to demean what you're doing or anything, but there's a big difference between people who are not law enforcement affiliated, have never worked on the street, never seen crimes committed other than to open a book and see what the penal code or what the traffic, you know, codes are and things like that, and then make categories versus people who know what those things are because of their experience and seeing somebody, somebody who's been attempted to be murdered or something like that? Uh, I, yes, I think from the prosecution side, I think uh, regardless of what the initial uh, crime was documented as on the street, when it comes to our office for charging, if the facts uh, indicate that there's something more than an aggravated assault, meaning an attempted murder, whether actually the person that was their intent when they committed a crime, we, they will be charged with attempted murder. So it'll be reported, I guess, at arraignment or the arrest would up, be updated later to show that it was a uh, uh, attempted murder. Uh, okay. Arrest. Well, I guess that's part of the question. I, I guess uh, it's just so broad that it's hard to actually, you know, put your finger on exactly what you want, because um, you know, I know when I go out on the, you know, if I'm I'm the reporting officer and I and I see somebody that's got his, you know, neck sliced because somebody really wanted to kill him, and it's just a, you know, two forty five now. I mean, it goes to your office now. It's a attempt murder charge. Well, you know, what goes into Argus, for instance, is a 245. It's not an attempt murder. So when that gets reported out, it's not reported. It, it might come out in one of these nice reports as a 245, but not as attempt murder. Is that, is that, am I making sense with that? Or Yeah, and I think the, the ag assault um, um, category is very broad because ag assault could mean a physical uh, hands and feet assault versus a, a firearm. So that's a, right. that's a big difference, right? right. If you're interested in... Uh, gun violence versus just you know mutual combat types of things. Uh, it's tough. To, it's maybe tough to decipher between the two. Yeah, I I think that's I, I, the point I'm getting at is that uh, for me, if I if I was sitting back and I was looking at all this, uh, I'm not sure I would really have the true picture unless I'm you know seeing every day coming across my desk in some kind of. Uh, report, you know, from, you know, the watch commander or somebody about what's really happened out on the street. Just, just my opinion. I could be wrong. Maybe this is working better for you. Are y'all that I, I think um, the education piece also, because I think what we're seeing is that um, I think the in initial investigating officers uh, do a good job collecting the evidence and also the follow-up investigators do a really good job following up with witnesses, collecting evidence. So by the time it gets to our office, they usually have a good idea of what happened, whether initially it was um, come out as a, uh, a 245 or assault with a deadly weapon. By the time it comes to us, it has gone through some um, initial investigation in the field and then some subsequent investigation by the investigators they've probably a good idea of the background that led to the shooting, meaning that there's a history there. There may have been some bad blood and the person in fact did intend to kill the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the victim. So I think um, maybe education and I think outreach to it to, to indicate how these things are reported. So they reflect accurately when uh, agencies are, are pulling this data out. Okay. Are um, mayors and council members uh, providing any of these reports? Ever, well, you know, on occasion they are they do request and we provide them. But I see your point. You know, on on certain cases like attempted homicide, I think internally we have those stats and we know how many attempted homicides we have. But in a system like this, without knowing a whole lot about it, it appears what's being reported out to the to the republic. Those types of crimes are kind of being watered down and categorized and just kind of an aggravated assault, and you're not seeing. You're seeing how many homicides there were, but you're not seeing how many attempts there actually were to 
to commit homicide based on the intent of the suspect. So I, I see the point that you're making, I think, but I think internally agencies uh, are able to access those stats more specifically. Yeah, okay, I get that. Well, okay, I, I get that you think that might should take public comments, but I think some of the questioning I'm doing right now might help the public to form other questions as they come forward. At least I'm I'm hoping that's and that's why I wanted to go first on this, uh, because there if I've got questions, I guarantee the public has questions. And the other thing I wanted to make is that as a policymaker, as the mayor, as a council member. I don't have full understanding what all this stuff is, even after I've asked for it. Um, it may be difficult for me to actually to determine the right resources, the right staffing to make sure, because I know when, you know, Chief Kate comes to me and says, you know what, I really need more people on the street. And I go, not according to this report. And then now I have to really have him drill down onto me what it really means. So, I, I think I think it's great that we have the reporting system comes out with a good information, um, but I just don't think it's as as uh, accurate and maybe uh, as wholesome as it should be. Just just an opinion, and now I'll go on to a public comment. First, we have Truth, followed by Blair Beekman. Oh, by the way, thanks for your patience with me answering all those questions. All right, I have more analysis than questions, but great questions, John. Thanks for shattering the thin ice the system seems to sit on. Is that true that hate crimes are California specific? And how is gambling a crime against society while rape isn't? That's kind of strange. The system's comparison though is very interesting. I think there are pros and cons to both because real-time reporting is always better. And having an incident today is much more accurate and effective for solving crime should have been done to begin with. But I argue the FBI doesn't need to get reports on every little crime, especially because they are a criminal organization. But the only reason everything's getting sent to them is not safety or stats is because in return, agencies are going to get those debt dollars. I did enjoy all the cartoon graphics. Does the state think it's legal to show pictures of cartoon firearms, though? Just like I said earlier, the Sandex slides show that despite propaganda, during the last three years, crime in San Diego County is at an all-time low. Some people dispute that. Violent crime is down. Crimes against people are down. Even property crime is down. Sheriffs and police should be celebrating instead of begging for ALPRs. The media should be showing videos of the celebrations instead of showing rare mob smash and grabs to justify ALPRs. The sad thing about the rape stats is that they're undoubtedly higher than they appear because most women never report. Assault going up isn't surprising. There's a lot of anger, frustration, and trauma from the stupid lockdowns that has yet to be dealt with by individuals or society on the whole. There were teenagers and young adults trapped at home with nothing to do and no one to talk to. They could barely breathe with those useless masks on their face. They're told everyone they know is diseased and they were left with no outlets. What did everyone think was going to happen when you treat innocent people like prisoners? And then when these same teenagers and young adults are seeing that stealing under a thousand bucks is okay, then of course, theft is going to go up. Depression and suicidal thoughts also were a direct result of the lockdown era, and so drug offenses and use being up is also no surprise. The worst part about drug addicts is they're going to usually do crime, other crimes, theft. It's too bad common sense is highly uncommon because the crime would be almost non-existent at this point if reps and sense, had sense and guts Time to say no to up. lockdowns. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman. Thanks a lot for this item. Uh, I've been learning today the importance of public oversight for the future of uh, data collection and uh, statistical data collection with things like this. So good luck in, in public oversight practices with these sort of things. Thank you very much for the report in that it very, very nicely described that you're defining new ways to uh, define crime and finding new ways to do that. And so with that, statistical numbers are gonna look a little larger. And we have to be clear about that, how we're reporting over the next few years. Um, like I've said earlier, it, you know, Mayor, uh, Chief Nislet and Mayor Gloria of San, of San Diego have both you know, stated that uh, violent crime is going down. And that showed that here, uh, not just in San Diego, but in the state and across the country. 
how we're going to deal with new issues of uh, tons of new technology to address property crime issues. I question that. I really, I know that working uniformly can bring you results that you're looking for, and that's pretty hard to break through. But I, I just don't feel it's necessarily the right tactic. And to just dump in more technology when we already have a fairly good amount in place to deal with the future of property crime issues, which have gone down also, I think, how do we continue those efforts of dialogue, of, of working with different people in different groups to, to address those things instead of you're using it as an excuse to dump in new technology, I feel. It's not really needed, but you have an excuse now and you're going to use it. And I'm not happy about that. So to, to finally conclude, to report uh, the city of Oakland, their uh, gun use uh, is down, but yet their killings are actually higher. Uh, so, you know, they're being more accurate. Gunplay is no longer fashionable. People now use guns to kill. Good luck how we talk about our violent crime statistics and all of, all of our statistics, statistics. Thank you. We have one virtual original draw. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. Um, but, you know, it's just really hard to sit and listen to people who engage in crimes themselves determine what is and what isn't a crime. And I'm a victim of being assaulted and it doesn't seem to count um, because someone was wearing a costume. So I feel like if I wear a Gestapo costume, does that mean I can go and beat people up? and you know shoot people unload my weapon um you know and then treat victims like crime criminals um because this information that you have in this system that you like to transfer back and forth to different law enforcement agencies has made it so that the police believe that i'm a threat to them after i was assaulted by a sheriff speaking at a meeting so if I can't ever get justice because somebody was wearing a costume and you guys are sitting here, you know, wanting us to have faith in, in you guys and think that what you're doing is good when you're sharing information like this. It's really hard when it's the criminals that are the ones determining what is and what isn't a crime. And then the people can never get justice because you, you consider some people victims and some not. And it's like, again, if I did the same exact thing to anybody, I would be a criminal for it and I would be in jail for it. But because someone has a costume on, they can be exonerated. And I don't understand how that in instills any kind of trust in anybody, but makes them fearful of encountering you guys, especially when there's times when like there's somebody who has a mental health issue and you guys unload your weapons on them and shoot them dead. So it's just really hard to sit and listen to the propaganda that comes out of your mouths when there is no justice for, for victims. That concludes public comment. Thank you. All right. Committee members. I don't think, no, we're not. Okay, well, thank you for looking at me then. <clears throat> uh, I, I just had a follow-up uh, to what you had stated earlier, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, is there any way that that we can make this uh, more public friendly? So I was working not in this area, but in a different area, and all the care, all the descriptions of the crime categories were so broad that it could include murder to rape. And I just, if we were able to drill it down a little easier so we knew, so the public would understand and people that didn't serve in law enforcement would understand, it would be helpful to me and it'd be a stronger tool. Because I agree with John, you're sitting on the dais, you get this report and you really can't tell because the categories are so broad that you know, am I, look, they're all bad things. I'm not saying if it's good, but there's a big difference between somebody being physically harmed and somebody being financially harmed in terms of their hospital stay. And so that's looking at this information, if there's anything we can do 
to adjust it, I think that would be very, very helpful to decision makers. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, then. In that case, we're going to move on. Takes us to uh, item number eight. And uh, that's a, a regional safety planning update. And that will be by uh, Samuel Sanford, Marissa Mangan. Did I get that right? And uh, Connor Vons. Good afternoon, Vice Chair. Good afternoon, committee members. Thank you for having us here today to provide an update on regional traffic safety efforts. And in particular, uh, well, I should say, my name is Sam Sanford. I'm a senior regional planner within the regional planning division here at Sandag. This item today touches on two planning efforts and then a, a data product as well that helps support both those planning efforts. So we have the regional active transportation plan and the update, or excuse me, and the Regional Vision Zero Plan. The Vision Zero Plan is a comprehensive traffic safety plan looking at crashes across the region. And then the Regional Active Transportation Plan that my colleague Marissa will get into is looking at cycling, bicycling, and pedestrian safety. So these two planning efforts are really being supported by the third topic, which is this traffic safety dashboard. The currently adopted 2021 regional plan has near-term implementation actions, essentially actions that the region is going to accomplish before the, the next regional plan. And those, two of those include these planning actions. So we're making significant advancement on those prior to the 2025 plan. The 2025 regional plan also includes a new goal area which is safety. So for the first time, we have safety as one of the leading goals in our regional plan. And these two plans are key elements to advancing that effort. I should say, immediately following the 21 regional plan, staff went right to work on safety and ended up drafting a Vision Zero resolution that went to the board of directors in July of 2022. And was passed essentially directing staff to advance this, this type of work, come up with a, a plan, a series of policies, and a data dashboard, uh, which is why we're here today to provide those updates. So this slide highlights that we can achieve more together as a region, comprehensively looking at safety, looking at our projects, our programs, our policies all together that come out of these two planning efforts, and that then we can advance as a region to, to address safety across uh, the 18 cities, the county, and the 17 federally recognized tribes that lie within San Diego County. A, a key piece of both these plans is that their foundation is on data, using the data that comes from the traffic safety dashboard and that analysis. They also will advance further through the public engagement and outreach uh, as we go forward into the community to get information through digital means as far as engagement through, uh, through the web, but also in-person engagement as well. The transitioning specifically to the Vision Zero Action Plan itself, as I mentioned before, this will be a comprehensive safety action plan. The aim of any Vision Zero plan is to get to zero fatalities and serious injuries. Vision Zero rejects the idea that fatal and serious crashes are inevitable. It does not see these as a cost of using our transportation system. It rejects that whole notion, sees these as uh, preventable incidents. And starting from that frame, we move forward to see what we can accomplish on our roadways. It is involving safer streets, safer roads, safer drivers or road users, safer vehicles, post-crash care, and emergency response. So it's multiple layers of redundancy and security for enhancing safety on our region. So let's look where we're at currently. Now this slide of, of bar graphs will 
be greatly outshined later on when my colleagues Grace and Connor get to show the data dashboard. But the intent of this is trying to give us an update of, of how things are looking first at our state. If we look at the top graph, these are the number of fatalities from the past or for one decade, looking from 2011 to 2020. And you'll see that the in the last, later half of that decade, the number of fatalities has increased. If I were to go back and update this graph and add 2021 data that was recently finalized or provisional 2022 data, we'd see additional increases. So despite tremendous amounts of work and effort, the trend is going in the wrong direction. And it's time we need to look at new approaches, new avenues, uh, kind of circle back as to what can be done to help address the number of fatalities and serious injuries on our roadways. If we look at our county, so the bottom graph, uh, Unfortunately, our county is not an exception to this trend that we're seeing statewide. So if we were to put a trend line on those bottom 10 bars, we'd also see it increasing from left to right over time. So our approach to start this effort is first setting up a, this, this major planning effort. And we were fortunate enough to be selected in what USDOT U.S. Department of Transportation calls their Safe Streets and Roads for All grant program. And in that program, SANDAG was selected to develop really three plans. Uh, I'll be specifically talking most today about the Regional Vision Zero Action Plan. But we also partnered with the City of Vista to develop a city uh, comprehensive safety action plan and also the La Jolla Band of Luiseno Indians to develop a tribal safety action plan. And then we have a significant grant partner with Caltrans District 11 helping out as well. The approach on the regional Vision Zero action plan is to see the transportation system as the public uses it. As they traverse our network, walking, biking, rolling, whichever mode they choose, they're not thinking of what the ownership or maintenance responsibility is of that segment. They're not thinking, oh, I'm on city of San Diego property, but I'm about to call a go into county of San Diego or Caltrans facilities. We just drive a role as we need to. And that's how the Vision Zero Action Plan for the region is looking at the transportation system. So with that, we're gonna develop several kind of key deliverables. First, we start off with an existing conditions report. We need to know where and to what frequency crashes are occurring along our network, what the severity is, the crash type, the uh, primary collision factors, contributing factors, and getting all that information for the entire network. From that, we start developing what is called a high injury network. And I wanna pause on this one. Here we have an example from our uh, sister agency to the north, the SCAG or Southern California Association of Governments, they've gone through this process in the past and they developed a high injury network for their large area, which is multiple counties for LA, Orange County, Imperial, and a few others. What they found is that 65% of all their fatal and serious injuries occurred on only 5.5% of their network. So right away, it's taking what can feel like an insurmountable problem where do you even start with something so large? And they're able to whittle it down to 5.5% of their network. Granted, that is still a large part of a huge network for LA, for this uh, planning area. But we're going to do something very similar for this region and help fine tune where we can focus finite resources to have the biggest impact on traffic safety. From there, we'll come up with safety solution recommendations. And these recommendations will be based on the, essentially the context of what facility type, if it's an arterial road versus a, a collector or a lower uh, use road, and also working with the local jurisdictions to come up with maybe solution sets, essentially, not saying this type of solution has to go in this particular location, but here are a multitude of solutions that would work for the crash types and severities that are being experienced at that location. Through that, we'll also have a prioritized list of projects and uh, programs and policies. And the reason we want to have that list of projects specifically is that the development of this regional plan allows the 18 cities, the county, and the 17 tribes to be eligible for future Safe Streets and Roads for All funds. So that's a big uh, element behind this approach is essentially eligibility for advancing safety and future funding cycles. 
And then last bullet on here is coming up with plan templates. Should other cities or tribes want to have a more granular focused plan for their area, we'll have templates borrowed from the city of Vista and the Hoya Band of Lewis and Indians that can be repurposed for other areas as well. So with that, I will pass it on to my colleague, Marissa. Thank you, Sam. I'm now gonna speak for a few minutes on our regional active transportation plan update. It's part of this package of uh, near-term implementation actions that Sam described per our last regional transportation plan. And Sandag uses an active transportation plan as the guiding light, so to speak, for all of the bikeway facilities with supporting pedestrian improvements uh, that we plan, design, and build for the region. And we do it always in collaboration with our local jurisdictions, including Caltrans, to ensure that there's a fully connected regional network of bikeways throughout the region, connecting to all the regional popular places for work or play that we like to go to. This active transportation plan was last developed in 2010, so it's overdue for an update and we're excited to get started. And especially we want to account for new uh, active transportation opportunities and things that have occurred in the last dozen years, including the prevalence of e-bikes for both uh, carrying people around and small goods, uh, devices that are helping folks with limited mobility or disabilities to get around, and even helping folks that are, are in our older adult population get around safely. So we're keeping those things in mind as we update the network. And I wanted to show a couple of maps to also kind of illustrate the types of connections that we need to be thinking about. Since we've had several cycles of our regional transportation plan get adopted since 2010, including the introduction of a concept called mobility hub areas, like is shown on the map on the left with the pink areas, we wanna make sure the update of our regional bikeway network connects all 30 of those areas throughout the region. They are places that are going to be essentially saturated with transportation solutions, and we need to make sure the regional bikeway network Network connects. And the map on the right shows uh, areas within our region that have a high a prevalence of short trip ends. Those trips that are four miles or less, uh, a lot of those hot spots in the dark red or purple are showing where a lot of short trip activity is happening. And that's a real great opportunity to encourage folks to consider shifting from driving to biking and walking for some of those shorter trips. Uh, and that those areas have great uh, overlap and uh, nice coverage with the mobility hub areas shown on the left. As we embark on the uh, update of the regional bikeway network, we're thinking about a wide variety of trips, lengths, trip types, uh, as we uh, update um, the density of the network and the places that it'll reach. So we're not thinking of the bikeway network any differently than a highway or a transit network. There are people that are going to use it for a long period of time, like they would uh, on a highway to go from one end of the region to the other. Uh, or use it for a short period of time, like they would hop on a bus and use it for only a couple of stops. The same kinds of um, um, phenomenon kind of uh, 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 relate to uh, the bikeway network. And we're thinking also beyond just the work trip. Commute trips only account for about a third of our travel, and there's a lot of opportunities on the weekends and the evenings for non-work activities to uh, consider uh, the bikeway network for those things. Uh, in addition to the fact that nearly half of our trips in the region are under three miles. So we're keeping those things in mind as we update the network as well. Sam and I are coordinating very closely on community engagement related to both plans since we are developing them at the same time. So in addition to providing formal working group and committee updates like this to you all today, we've launched a digital outreach uh, portal for uh, community engagement for uh, residents in the region to be able to voice their opinions and concerns around traffic safety and about safer uh, ways to walk and bike. We're going to be doing uh, many public in-person events throughout the region over the next year uh, regarding both plans to collect community input, go to the communities directly and hear from them uh, about their, um, their concerns and their challenges in addition to some of their solutions that they suggest for both traffic safety and better regional bikeway connections. And we've also contracted with a variety of community-based organizations to assist us with some of this in-person outreach. 
Uh, we're going to be leveraging social media to get the word out as well in a creative way about the development of both plans. And we have formed a technical advisory group comprised of subject matter experts that we don't really get to talk to very often. And that includes some representatives from the first responders group. We have representatives from uh, the sheriff and fire community in addition to trauma services, hospital, health and human services agency, AARP, et cetera. This is a, just a snip from our currently live interactive online engagement portal with the URL and a QR code on the slide. It's going to be open at least through the end of the calendar year. We'd love your help in getting the word out so that people can use it uh, to provide their input. And we're also making sure that we, of course, consider equity as part of our community engagement strategy. We wanna make sure it's very inclusive. We wanna be able to um, account for people's lived experience and reach them where they are in their communities. Uh, make sure we provide all of our materials in various languages to communicate with everyone around the region and really uh, center equity at the forefront of our data analysis to make sure that new regional bikeway connections that we may be um, uh, proposing, some of the safety solutions that will come out uh, in response to the result of the high injury network is prioritizing those equity communities. And as far as next steps, we are developing the high injury network now, and we'll be excited to release the results of that analysis early in 2024. We'll be continuing with various data analysis to help us update and release the draft regional active transportation network next year. Uh, by spring, the Vision Zero Action Plan will be drafted uh, so that it can be publicly released and ready for adoption by our board. And we'll continue to uh, conduct stakeholder outreach throughout the calendar year of 2024 as it relates to the active transportation plan itself. And I'll hand it over to Grace next. Good afternoon, Vice Chair and POC committee members. My name is Grace Mino. I'm a Principal Research Analyst here in the Data Science Department under Cindy Burke. I just want to give a quick background and context prior to Connor jumping into the traffic safety dashboard. Um, back in 2018, our Transnet Triennial Performance Audit had recommended that SANDAG collect traffic safety uh, statistics and do a performance monitoring effort on that front. And previously, Sam and other staff had collected um, the California Highway Patrol's statewide integrated traffic reporting systems data, and we had about 50 15 years worth of data saved on our server. And so this is where Connor comes in. We've had um, multiple divisions within SANDEG and also a lot of external engagement with a, a, all, almost all the jurisdictions and with CHP um, to design and talk about and discuss the use and feel of a traffic safety dashboard. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Connor who led this effort. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Grace, and thank you everybody for having me. It's a pleasure to introduce this dashboard to you all. Uh, it's been a project long in the making, but we're very excited to have this out in the public. So um, just a quick plug before I kind of get into the contents of the dashboard. Uh, this lives in the open data portal, as Grace mentioned, and so this is a great uh, option for uh, all of Sandag's data to be made available, not only uh, in the effort of being transparent with everything that we work with, but also um, in making data accessible to everybody, because this is something that uh, while this data that I'm going to be showing you is publicly available, um, in a lot of ways, shapes and forms, really the value that we add here is by making it uh, accessible um, and in a format that is easy to work with and understandable to people of all different kinds of backgrounds and all different skill sets. Um, so uh, right here, uh, there's two main data sources for this dashboard. Um, the first one and the one that's about 80% of this dashboard is comes from the uh, California Highway Patrol's uh, statewide integrated uh, traffic reporting system, also known as SWITERS. So uh, that uh, dashboard include, or that data source includes all collisions that are reported to law enforcement or responded to by law enforcement in our region. And so what that's not gonna include is things that obviously aren't reported. So let's say you have a fender better on the side of the road, everybody swaps information, everybody goes home, nobody shows up on the law enforcement side, that's not gonna be included in this dashboard. Um, in addition to that, things that happen on private property will not be included in this dashboard as well. So I think in like uh, maybe let's say a Home Depot parking lot or um, in a parking lot for uh, like San Diego State, for example. So um, this is in our known universe of incidents that are reported to law enforcement. This is gonna have, uh, be as close as what we can get here. 
Um, the other data source that we have is going to be coming from our Federal Transit Authority uh, Administration. So that's uh, what I'm going to refer to as FTA. And so uh, that's going to include uh, a couple of pages that you'll see a little bit later that uh, are related to transit-related uh, collisions and also um, rail-related uh, collisions. And so the flow of this dashboard, it kind of uh, has a mixture of both Power BI pages, and I'll kind of explain a little bit about what that is in a little bit. But then it also includes a web viewer map, uh, which allows people to kind of zoom into neighborhoods, search addresses, and also filter this data. So um, really Sandag's role in this project here, what we're doing is we're not really changing the contents uh, of what's actually being reported to the California Highway Patrol. What we're really doing is we're just cleaning it up a little bit. We're making it uh, usable for everybody, like I mentioned. So what we're really doing is we're recoding variables to give a label instead of a code. And then our GIS team actually had a pretty good, pretty big lift and what they did was they actually went and added location information that is more refined so that way collisions that uh, maybe were reported as happening in a location where they didn't actually happen we're able to go ahead and identify records that uh, are erroneous and go ahead and provide improved uh, location information for a handful of records um, so this data has chp uh, switters data going back to 2006 through 2022 and then this also has uh, uh, fta data dating back between about 1970 or 2014 depending on the topic all the way through uh, 2021 to 2022. And before we dive in a little bit further, one final caveat that I'll mention is that uh, calendar year 2021 was recently made provisional. Now, uh, Switters normally has about a year and a half delay between when the data is made final and uh, when it was uh, first originally labeled as provisional. And so what you're going to be seeing here today, we have, we're have we still in the process of having our GIS team go and update the 2021 final data. So 2021 and 2022, what you're going to see here is provisional. Um, and we will actually be making 2023 available sometime mid next year. And so we should have the finalized 2021 numbers available by the end of this calendar month. Uh, so as you can see here, just starting off, we have an overview section. So uh, this page is kind of split up in a couple of different topics. And so this first one here is just an overview. Um, it allows you to filter by uh, date range, by area, and also by collision severity. Um, what you're seeing here is two main figures. You have a primary collision factors table, which as you can imagine by the name, are the primary collision factors that are associated with um, the collisions that you have filtered. And then you also have a trends over year time, which we call collisions by year. And so that's showing you the total number of collisions based on the uh, filters that you have selected over the course of the years and those numbers will go ahead and highlight that uh, one big benefit to power bi is that as you scroll over or hover over any one particular item you'll have a little tooltip window that'll fly out over your mouse and give you some more details related to what it is exactly that you have over it um, and then right here, what you also notice is the three main headline numbers there. That's total collisions, total injured, and total fatalities. Um, those, as you can, can guess by the names, those are just kind of summary numbers. So as you're kind of filtering through the numbers, um, you'll have something to come back to. And those are kind of, the, we found the easiest ways to keep an eye on exactly uh, the universe of information and collisions that you have selected. Um, and then one last thing, if Daniel, I could have you just go ahead and click on any one of those primary collision factors right there, just in the table on the right, that works too. But yep, any one of those go ahead and click on those as you can see what power bi also allows you to do is if, if you click on any one uh feature of the uh, any of the figures on the page the rest of the figures on that page will also react so what this really allows you to do is just get really interactive you know everybody has different needs for different types of topics on different areas and so this really allows users of all experience levels to uh play around with data in a way that is uh flexible enough to respond to a very nuanced approach and a very very granular kind of planning or um, implementation side of things, but also maybe just someone who's moving into a new neighborhood wants to know which corners on their neighborhood are most dangerous. Um, so moving on to the next section, if you want to scroll down, we have a regional map here. Um, so this is a great map. The first thing that you'll notice here uh, on the map are these bubbles here. Those we call clusters. And what they do is they just go ahead and cluster together big groups of collisions depending on the zoom level. And so as you zoom in and out, the clusters will change. And those numbers in the middle just summarize the number of collisions based on the filters that you have. Now I mentioned filters because you have a couple on the left side of your screen. Not only can you search for a specific place or a street corner, what you can also do is you can actually filter by years um, and then you can also filter by collision severity 
Um, and so what we're actually doing right now, as you can see, you're only allowed to go up to 2020, but this allows you to filter by all kinds of different years. And so, um, like I said, we're going to have 2021 made available in this map by the end of this calendar month. Um, and if you click on any one of those individual dots, uh, you'll see a summary of different statistics, and it'll just kind of give you some high-level uh, headline information about that different cluster, and then even down to the individual collision, which is just the, the dots without the, the numbers in them. Um, one, else, one other great thing about this is that this map allows you to view a uh, set of web layers. So, Daniel, if you click that little uh, blue box that's just to the right of the, yeah, click that. So as you can see there, we have a couple of different layers here that just kind of overlay some kind of socioeconomic information as well as infrastructure conditions over different areas so that as you zoom in, you'll have a little bit of kind of context to what those neighborhoods are and what the infrastructure looks like. Um, if you want to continue to scroll down here, um, I'm not going to go ahead and go into detail about the rest of these. As you kind of see, you can spend, um, I think a gentleman in the last meeting that we presented this to said he was going to get a pizza and uh, spend all night taking a look at this. Not saying that there's uh, worse ways to spend your evening, but uh, there's a lot of information included in here. And so what uh, really the, the big features here, and we'll go into some of these next topics. We have a section on pedestrians and bicyclists. We also have a section on demographics, which gets down to the individuals that are involved in these collisions and then we also have a rail and a transit page as well and so as you get deeper and deeper into this dashboard you have more and more information that you're allowed to query from and also access and so the idea is that the general public someone who's a more of a casual data consumer they'll have the ability to view headline topics on the top overview page and then those of us who are a little bit more uh, data uh, heavy consumers as we get further and further into this dashboard you have more and more opportunity to find more information about what exactly you need is and then lastly one thing that i will mention uh, if you want to just go ahead and scroll down to the bottom sections um, you're going to have a section that is a how-to now we did get some feedback recently uh, that while this dashboard is fantastic and one of uh one of my sh shining moments as a as a junior staff member here the it is kind of hard to use you know and so one thing that is very high up on our to-do list is to make a how-to video uh, that will go ahead and walk you through what exactly it is that you're clicking on what happens when something reacts and why something is appearing the way that it is um, but we do have a, a brief uh, written example if you want to scroll down just a little bit more um, just of how to use this dashboard um, and then lastly, uh, as I mentioned, this wouldn't be an open data portal unless you were able to download the data. And so while this is, oh, this data source is open to the public to access, we've gone ahead and provided the data that we are using to, uh, to power these visuals in the links that's right below that say download this data. And so that from there, you're able to view not only the data itself, but also standardized metadata, including uh, what cleaning processes were done and uh, the whole realm of uh, information that you could ask for from this. So um, yeah, like I mentioned, uh, I've really appreciate everybody's time here and I'll go ahead and pass it back to the vice chair to open it up for questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you. We have, uh, we have public comments. We have two public truth followed by Blair Beekman. I like that. Play with data. We can get whatever numbers you want. Why? A big element behind the approach is money. Vision Zero is a $3.1 million fraud. Achieving zero pedestrian fatalities is inevitably an impossibility, especially because cities can't even manage to fix broken sidewalks and potholed roads that cars, bikes, scooters, and walkers are all hitting and suing cities for millions of dollars over. Yes, they are thinking about who's liable. While Sandag funds bike lanes that often cost $2 million a mile, transportation equality is missing. Well, and, and who's helping fatalities from riding the public transit that Sandag pushes? All modes of transportation deserve equal attention and funding. But the real agenda is a vision of zero cars by installing as many obstacles as possible for drivers. As admitted in this item, using measures created and funded by the U.S. Department of Transportation called Safe Streets or Complete Streets. No one in San Diego County or even California came up with this federal government plan or ideas. And San Diego's Vision Zero Action Plan mentions analyzing travel and demographic data of an individual. That sounds like more tracking by an agency that refuses to admit that their operating system plan includes tracking all cars, public transit, bikes, and even scooters. All the Vision Zero Fatality Fraud is contained in Sandag's YouTube video entitled Sandag Webinar on AB43 and AB1938. 
There, everyone can hear San Francisco's municipal transportation agency admit that even lowering speed limits to as low as 20 miles per hour with signs everywhere made absolutely no change in fatalities. The representative Vicente Romero literally said they're just hoping things would improve. So this fraud is going to continue here with high injury networks and by the biased outreach to community based organizations who, according to political campaigner Sean Harris, said would ensure that the right people attend Sandag events. Not me. Will my public engagement at events be presented just like it wasn't for the regional plan and the new CEO outreach? So I'm going to say the only thing I liked about your very concrete presentation was the part about pizza. Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman. Uh, Thank you uh, for this item. I mentioned the uh, earlier in the meeting the importance of uh, taking a holistic approach to, to uh, Vision Zero issues with tech accountability, with um, environmental issues. Um, I, there's just a host of things uh, within the community to bring together and how to talk about the future of Vision Zero. Good luck how you can do that. Um, you received some traffic safety grant money on the previous uh, committee meeting this morning. That was an agenda item that was really interesting that may be of interest to talk about here that helps promote the future of these Vision Zero ideas. So good luck to yourselves in this work. Uh, tech accountability to me is just incredibly important and meaningful how it can uh, add to the process of, uh, you know, when you make uh, the technology for these items, open and accountable with the public, uh, make it a, a dialogue. Uh, I think it becomes more interesting and and hopeful of what the future of this project can be and our community lives can be, basically. So good luck with that. And also a reminder, of course, uh, Guadalajara, Mexico, uh, they do some incredible work, uh, you know, in closing down their streets and having like four day festivals uh, you know, where they have, they provide health services, uh, goods, and uh, it's just a big community event that's really interesting. And that's ways of Vision Zero that I hope we can learn to address. That's the real depth of Vision Zero, that um, the, the mayor of Guadalajara actually visited Sandag a few months ago as just a part of uh, all the people who passed through here uh, from the global south that I'm just amazed about. And thank you again for, for that type of effort and good luck on this item. Thanks. And our last speaker, virtual, the original draw. Man, the road to hell is surely paved with good intentions. Imagine if there was a dashboard for all the vaccine injured. <laughs> then people probably wouldn't be taking death shots. Um, but this is interesting because it's like you guys love your data and you know you got to get us out of our car. So what better way than to, you know, br bring all this data forward that can then be used to get us out of our cars because it is so, so dangerous to drive. So, so dangerous. And just thinking that you guys think that you can go to Vision Zero. I just think it's funny when people think that they're God and I don't mean the big G, I'm talking about the little G thinking that, you know, you can just like stop something from happening all while you're like, let's put people in lithium bombs because that's really going to make sure that they don't die. <laughs> like, I just think it's so funny because if people really saw what you guys were doing and knew and like saw the writing on the wall, they would see. It's just pretty crazy watching your own enslavement. It's interesting, you know, because you have all this propaganda that comes forward and it's like, you know, just listening to you guys talk about stuff is uh, rather disturbing. <laughs> so, it is. It's very, very disturbing because you're like, we're going to get rid of fatalities. We're going to do this. We're like, I mean, I just in, in the number zero, it's like, really? I mean. I don't know if you have people like Jack Shu that just like walk across the street and expect cars to stop. Don't know how that's going to help with fatalities, but you know what? It's a good way to blame it on drivers, right? Like, I can't believe they weren't paying attention. I can't believe that semi just hit me. I mean, that's totally his fault. I may have walked across the street and gone right in front of him, but I mean, he should have known I was going to be there. So, yeah, it's just very sad to 
listen to all of this and, you know, uh, the way that you think that you can control anything like that. I mean, just even like the climate that doesn't need saving, but we're like, let's save it. doesn't matter if people die in the process or it makes them poor as hell, but you know what? It's good. Satan is so proud. That concludes public comments. Great. Committee members, questions? Joel? Um, can we go back to slide, I think it was eight or nine. Is it possible? Uh, it was nine then. Uh, when thinking and looking at this, uh, I can't help but notice all the clusters, uh, for the most part, have no unincorporated communities. And there's a half a million people that live in the unincorporated. And uh, I'm grateful that la our last meeting, executive committee voted to put an advisory seat from the unincorporated. But up to now, we've been laser focused on 18 cities and a half a million people. There was no equity for them. They didn't have a seat at the table. So I, when you're thinking about doing your rollout to get into the community, let's not forget those half million people. Uh, Lakeside's not in there. Ramona's not in there. Alpine's not in there. Fallbrook's not in there. So maybe we could do some outreach and do stuff. And we do have uh, bike routes, but there's little to no bus service. We have no trolley. We have no mass transit whatsoever. And I just think it's time to bring that portion of our county into the 21st century. Thank you for your hard work. And I'm, this is not a criticism, but this is why I'm on the board trying to change. Thank you. You know, you should be proud that you, uh, East County has already uh, got to vision zero. I, I should be happy with well, that's true too. Okay, anybody else before I go on? Okay, th this is one of those days for me, I guess. I have to apologize. My coffee cup isn't even half full because I, I'm a skeptic. I'm not optimistic about Vision Zero. I do have to say, though, I think it's always a good idea to do better and try and find ways of uh, saving people and keeping them from being injured. Um, I think some of the flaws for me that I see is uh, it's great to have design development. Uh, however, the people's behavior is what the um, problem is. And um, I'm one of those guys that believes fatalities and injuries are always going to be inevitable. So uh, just to put that out there. And the reason why I say that is because a great example is uh, you, you can train people all day long. We, every one of us, when we were teenagers, we went through some kind of uh, traffic uh, school, uh, you know, what they call it back then, driver's education. Uh, I don't know, in my day it was, you know, horse and buggy thing. But um, bottom line is that they showed you fatalities on their road. They showed you how to, you know, pass, how to go to a stop sign. And you know what? If you look around on the roads today, there's very few people that uh, follow those kind of uh, behaviors and training. And um, even driving, uh, you know, down here today from, you know, Escondido, it was, uh, you know, watching people on the highways. Uh, they're, they're driving too fast. They don't use turn signals. And those are all the kinds of things that cause traffic collisions. Um, you know, I, I was driving down the street the other day and some kid on one of those hover type skateboards or whatever they're called, I don't even know. Um, you know, cars are coming up to stop sign and he just keeps on going through, doesn't even slow down or stop, probably at 20 miles an hour. I've never seen one of them go that fast, but obviously they take the governor off of those or something. And uh, he's just lucky there's no cross traffic. Uh, that would have been a severe injury, if not fatality. So how do you address that kind of, I guess the question is, how do you address that kind of behavior? Um, you know, the uh, port's doing a great job by uh, banning all electric bicycles from uh, its area. However, um, probably the majority of bicyclists that uh, create uh, injuries um, are the people that are not on electric bicycles, for instance, because uh, they 
they drive 20 to 30 miles an hour on those high capacity bicycles that weigh about two pounds. Um, so nobody ever seems to address that. And then I made a note of uh, pedestrian violations are a high uh, primary cause of fatalities. So um, I remember when I, when I was working up in uh, the Hillcrest area and uh, bars were letting out at, you know, two o'clock in the morning and people were stumbling out in the street and getting hit by cars. How do you address that kind of behavior? Well, law enforcement is the one that addresses that behavior. But now, you know, the state of California took away the fact that you can't even cite uh, that's no longer uh, illegal to uh, do what we used to call jaywalking. Uh, so how do you address that behavior? Um, you know, the state of California and the lawmakers are taking away every bit of the law enforcement ability to, you know, address those types of things. So, um, you know, I have I have a lot of hope for what you're looking to do. And like I said, my coffee just isn't half full today. So, um, so those are the things I wanted to bring out. And and it's like the supervisor said, though, I you know I ride a bicycle. I do close to three thousand miles a year on those streets, especially in East County, and. Um, and so I, and I know I've been trained and, uh, and uh, there's a lot of bicyclists out there, especially in my city. Uh, you know, we sell almost 300 electric bicycles a year right now in that city alone. And we don't seem to have the same number of accidents as they do in some like the coastal cities for, for instance. So the question has to be, what are we doing differently there? And uh, so maybe some reach uh, outreach there um, to the, um, you know, bicycle, electric bicycle owners uh, might be able to help out with that. So just just some food for thought. And, you know, just like before, sorry, sorry, but I just have these thoughts and feelings about it. And, you know, Vision Zero, I, I'm not in my lifetime, I don't think. Well, until you get every, well, even if you took everybody out of cars and you took them off of the bicycles or any other thing that rolls, um, you're still going to have somebody that gets injured in some kind of traffic collision. You know, it happened all the time. People got run over by horses and wagons and buggies and things of that nature. You know, it's kind of like homelessness. How are we going to solve that? It's been around since before Christ came. So that's just my thoughts on that. Anybody else want to follow up on that? That would belabor that issue. All right, then. That takes us to... Uh, Let's see. I think that's it. Okay. Let's uh, item number nine, which is the next meeting of the Public Safety Committee is scheduled for Friday, February 16th, 24, uh, 2024, Ooh. right here at 1 p.m. We're adjourned. Thank you.